Welcome to the online module, Writing Specifications, offered by the West Virginia Purchasing Division. When you complete this training, you'll be asked to print off a certificate of completion. In order to gain credit for this course, you will need to complete the certificate and have it signed by your immediate supervisor or manager and email, fax, or send it to the Staff Development Specialist of the Purchasing Division. You'll find that contact information on the last slide of this presentation. Let's get started. In this presentation, you'll learn what specifications are and what role they play in the purchasing process. We'll discuss eight steps that will guide you through the process of writing effective specifications, and we'll explain the difference between good and bad specifications and how that might ultimately affect the types of bids that you receive. First, what is a specification? A specification is a concise statement explaining the type of commodity or service, the quality level, and any special requirements in design, performance, delivery, and usage. The purpose of a specification is to describe exactly what you need. The goal is to leave no room for misinterpretation of your need. Take pharmaceuticals as an example. Some medications require refrigeration and therefore special shipping and handling needs. If you didn't include that information in your specifications, you might receive bids from vendors who cannot meet that need. In essence, you might waste time and energy having to repeat the bidding process in order to receive bids from vendors who qualify. Another thing to keep in mind when writing specifications is any maintenance your desired item may need in the future. For example, if a piece of hardware requires maintenance for the next two or three years, you want to be sure to include that requirement in your specification so vendors know what information to include in their proposals. As you're probably aware, the Purchasing Division is responsible for the timely, responsive, and efficient procurement of commodities and services for state government. To ensure that contracts for these commodities and services are based on fair and competitive bid whenever possible, the West Virginia Code highlights important information related to the state purchasing process. West Virginia Code 5A33 provides the powers and duties to the Director of Purchasing. 5A330A emphasizes the equal and fair bidding process and stresses the importance of eliminating fraud in the procurement of commodities by the state. And West Virginia Code 5A331 speaks to corrupt combinations, collusions, or conspiracies, how they are prohibited, and the penalties for individuals found guilty of such things. The Code of State Rules is an interpretation of the West Virginia Code. The state rules are determined by our legislative branch and further clarifies the code so we can better understand our statutory and regulatory requirements. Purchasing is highlighted under Title 148, Department of Administration, Series 1. More specifically, Section 6.5.1 explains how specifications are written to encourage competition and to meet the needs of the spending units. It also illustrates that no person shall write or attempt to influence a drafter of specifications to limit competition or to favor or disfavor a particular vendor. And finally, to complement the West Virginia Code, the Purchasing Division includes valuable information in its Procedures Handbook. Section 4.1 in the Purchasing Division Procedures Handbook highlights some general steps that should be taken prior to the actual bidding process. These steps include, but are not limited to, defining the need in Section 4.2, considering acquisition and delivery lead time in Section 4.3, and writing specifications that will enhance competition when applicable and help you meet your need in Section 4.4. When writing specifications, there are eight steps that you should follow. These steps will take you through the process of determining what you need and then creating the specifications that will be used to solicit bids from vendors who can meet that need. We'll go through each of these in more detail in the coming slides. The first step is to define your need. What exactly is it that you're looking for? Next, check the availability of internal resources. If the commodity or service is not available to meet your needs, you'll need to check its availability through mandatory contracts, including statewide, agency, and mandatory piggyback contracts. If both of those attempts fail, research the market and identify possible vendors. You'll also need to consider the acquisition and delivery lead time. At this point, you should be ready to prepare your specifications. And finally, based upon the spending amount, you'll need to prepare the agency delegated request for quotations or the purchase requisition and determine the maximum budget amount. Let's talk more about each of these steps. When writing specifications, 
you must first define the need so that it's clear to vendors what you're looking for. Ask questions that include what, how much, how big, where, and when. These questions might include what do you need and how much of it do you need? Does it need to be a particular size? Where do you want it delivered and will you accept delivery only at certain times? Be specific in your answers. Also, determine what type of contract you're looking for. Do you need a fixed contract for a single purchase or are you looking for an open-end contract where multiple reoccurring purchases will take place? Having answers to all of these questions before you begin will ensure that you know what you need and that you relay that information effectively to vendors. Once a need is established, the agency must determine if the commodity or service is available from an internal resource. Internal resources include correctional industries, sheltered workshops, and the West Virginia State Agency for Surplus Property. If available through one of these internal resources, the commodity or service must be acquired through this manner. However, if the commodity or service is available, but not in the acquired time, quality, quantity, or other factors, a written waiver may be required from the internal resource in accordance with purchasing guidelines. More information on these guidelines may be found in Section 4.6 of the Purchasing Division Procedures Handbook. If the commodity or service is not available from any of these internal resources, the agency must determine if that commodity or service is available from a statewide agency or a mandatory piggyback contract. If available through one of those mandatory contracts, the agency must purchase the commodity or service in accordance with purchasing guidelines as indicated within these contracts. The website to the mandatory contracts issued by the purchasing division may be found on the screen in front of you. If you've gotten to the market research step, that means you've looked at internal resources and at mandatory contracts with no success. So what should you do next? Conducting market research and identifying potential vendors are the next steps. You want to find out what's available and who provides it. You can do this by talking to other agencies and finding out what their experiences have been, or you can talk to the vendors themselves. There are some restrictions when talking to vendors, however. They cannot be paid and cannot influence the specifications in their favor. To maintain fairness, you should contact more than one vendor, and if at all possible, you should convene the vendors in the same place at the same time. This would give you the opportunity to talk to vendors equally and openly. And finally, only gather objective information about the commodity or service. Once you conduct market research for the commodity or service you need, you may create a final list of potential vendors. One final step before writing your specifications is to consider the acquisition and delivery time. Consider how long you have to bid, evaluate, and award the contract. Then look at your current contract, if applicable, and determine when it expires. And lastly, think about the time limitations, or when you need the commodity or service. Whether you're writing specifications for requests for quotations or for other methods of procurement, you need to be specific in what you're asking for. Only state what you need as a mandatory specification and leave what you don't need as a preferred requirement. The next step is to actually begin creating specifications for the commodity or service for which you need. Specifications are included in the solicitation document and are arguably the most important aspect of a contract. They determine what you expect the vendor will supply, how it will be delivered, how it will be paid for, among other factors. There are three types of specifications that can be used to communicate requirements for commodities and services to the vendor, so you want to consider which type best suits your purchase. The first type is a brand name or equal specification and is based upon one or more manufacturer's commodity description, model number, and quality level. The general name of the item, for example, automobiles, air blowers, etc., should be listed first. The manufacturer and model number of the item should immediately follow. Keep in mind the words, or equal, are inserted to inform vendors that alternate bids will be considered. The manufacturer's commodity number must be easily identified in a current publication that is available to most vendors, and commodity descriptions must be sufficiently detailed and specify only the required features needed for the application. An example of a brand name or equal specification might be if an agency needs uniforms made. They might state they are looking for uniform pants made by or equal to the Levi brand. Keep in mind that unless a feature or requirement is specifically listed on the solicitation, it will not be used to disqualify a vendor. 
The next type of specification is a performance specification and is based upon the specific performance needs of the purchaser. The performance specification is less structured as to how the product is made and more structured as to how well it operates. Total ownership costs for operating and maintaining the product should be included in the specifications. A performance specification may require that a printer reproduces 3,000 sheets of paper before an ink cartridge needs replaced. In your requirements, you want to include the maintenance of the printer over the course of its life and perhaps even the cost of replacing the ink cartridges. And lastly, the third type of specification is a design specification. This type concentrates on the dimensional and other physical requirements of an item being purchased. The design specification is used when the commodity has to be specially made to meet the purchaser's unique needs. An example of a design specification might be if an agency needs to build a kitchen, and there's only a certain amount of space to place a refrigerator, stove, and dishwasher. To ensure that the appliances you purchase would fit in the space available, you'd want to make sure the specifications indicate the exact size of appliances that you need. Any vendor who could not meet the size requirements would be disqualified. This will ensure that once a kitchen is built, your appliances will fit perfectly into the space allotted to them. Regardless of what type of specification you are writing, there are some standards for writing good specifications. Good specifications are clearly understandable to both the buyer and the seller. They are complete and include every mandatory requirement that the agency requires a commodity or service to meet. Good specifications should also be concise, leaving out all unnecessary details, and whenever possible, they should be identifiable with some brand or specification already on the market. This will give vendors a better idea of exactly what you need and give them the opportunity to compare what they can offer to what you're looking for. A good specification is also verifiable, meaning it is written in such a way that the purchasing division can confirm that the bid submissions meet the specifications. In other words, it is quantifiable and non-subjective. The specification should be reasonable and legible. If the document containing a specification has been scanned or copied, make sure you can still read it. A specification should allow you to evaluate vendors equally, apples to apples. And finally, the specification should contain a cost structure that is consistent with the agency's need. Since we mentioned apples, let's use those as an example. Say you work for a school system and you need to purchase apples for a school's lunch menu for the entire school year. In the specifications, you want to include the type of apples you need, such as Granny Smith or Red, as well as an estimated quantity that you'll need. Remember that different types and or quantities might have different unit prices or discounts attached to them. To determine the cost total, you may need to use a catalog that includes the particular apples that you require. This will help you to establish the maximum budget amount and guarantees that the cost structure is consistent with the commodity that you're asking for. And finally, you need to be sure to include the time frame that you'll need the apples. For example, if you need one lump sum of apples delivered at the beginning of the school year only, specify that. But if you want 300 apples a week for the next 12 weeks, be sure to make that clear to the vendor. There are a few other best practices you should follow when writing effective specifications. First, ensure clarity in your writing by using precise terms whenever possible, vague terms when appropriate, and never using ambiguous terms. Precise terms eliminate room for conflict between the parties later by clearly stating what is required. Vague terms can be utilized to allow the parties some latitude in performing under the contract, but also leaves more room for a dispute to arise in the future. Be careful not to be too vague. Ambiguous terms are terms that have two or more possible meanings. Ambiguous terms should never be used in writing specifications. Be aware that an otherwise non-ambiguous term may become ambiguous depending on the context and factual background relating to the contract. Specifications should be organized and formatted to maximize readability and understanding of a contract document. Consistency is also important. Using terms repeatedly can seem monotonous, repetitive, and even boring, but it is necessary in writing specifications to avoid confusion and ambiguity. When referring to people, entities, commodities, services, or other referenced items, repeat the same term every time rather than using synonyms and other different terms. And finally, specifications with spelling and grammatical errors can be hard to read, so be sure to proofread your specifications. 
there can be serious consequences for poorly written specifications, both prior to and after the award of a contract. Prior to an award, bids may be rejected for not meeting requirements. This may be a result of the way the specifications were written, rather than the fact that the vendor does not actually meet the requirements you had in mind. Bid specifications may be protested and might result in the agency having to rewrite and resubmit their request, causing a delay in obtaining what the agency needs. And finally, vendors may increase their overall bid price to cover any ambiguity or inconsistency created by poor writing of specifications, leading to a higher cost for the agency and state. If specifications are written poorly, the award of a contract can also bring its own set of problems. Vendors may protest the award of the contract based on flawed specifications, which may or may not lead to litigation. A dispute between the agency and vendor may arise over the meaning of the contract and its requirements. The state may lose time, money, and the vendor service trying to resolve these problems. And worst case scenario, the end result may be the voiding of a contract after it is awarded. If you have questions about specifications that you are writing, you might seek help from several internal and external resources. You might ask vendors, who can provide you with the expertise necessary to properly describe the commodities or services that the agency needs to obtain. A best practice would be to consult with multiple vendors to ensure that competition is not limited by restrictive specifications. Coworkers might also be a good resource to utilize. They can help not only with the wording of specifications, but also with the formatting and proofreading of your document. The common tool of spell check can also help with spelling and grammar. Purchasing division buyers are also a wealth of information regarding the purchasing process and can assist you in ensuring effective specifications are written. And finally, the National Institute of Governmental Purchasing Incorporated provides examples of real-life specifications written for particular commodities and services through its specification database. Membership may be required to view this information. To summarize, when writing specifications, start by knowing what you need. Then think about what you would like, but what is not required. And finally, know the difference between the two. Keep in mind that you don't want your specifications to be too restrictive, locking in a specific vendor and limiting competition, but you also don't want them to be too vague, allowing a vendor to provide a lower than acceptable quality level or a higher than cost commodity or service. Mandatory terms are indicated by the use of the terms shall, will, must, maximum, or minimum. All mandatory terms and conditions in the written specification are absolute and compliance with those specifications cannot be waived. Failure to comply with mandatory terms shall require the vendor to be disqualified. If an intended mandatory specification is not preceded by one of these words, then it is not mandatory. So be careful to use these words only when applicable. Non-mandatory terms are indicated by the use of the terms may, should, preferred, or could, and are understood to be permissive and shall not be used to disqualify any vendor. Non-mandatory terms imply a preference, but still leaves room for competition for items that you want, but are not a mandatory requirement. Remember to limit these items. You want your specifications as concise as possible, leaving out unnecessary details. The final step in the writing specifications process is to prepare the agency request for quotations or purchase requisition. If the commodity or service is between $5,000 and $25,000, the agency will need to prepare the request for quotations form, also known as the WV-43. If the commodity or service is over $25,000, they'll need to prepare the purchase requisition using the WV-35 form, which they will then submit to the purchasing division. If you have questions about either form, you may contact your designated purchasing buyer. There are several items to consider when completing either the RFQ or the purchase requisition. First, the form must contain a description of the commodity or service for which you are requesting. It should be free of industry jargon, which might target specific vendors and exclude others, and instead should have a clear definition. It must avoid using subjective or non-quantitative language. The mandatory specifications also need to be clearly stated and may be bolded if you think it's necessary. It must not favor a brand or a vendor, and the description must always be written in a way that allows for competition. When submitting a purchase requisition for a solicitation over $25,000 to the purchasing division, 
you want to consider the quantity as well as the life of the contract. The standard term is a one-year contract with two one-year renewal options. When preparing your solicitation, consideration should be made to ensure the vendor's performance and to minimize any risk to the state. These considerations include, but are not limited to, bonds, insurance, and licensing. You also want to include your delivery requirements and your timelines for completion. Vendors should understand exactly what is expected of them. When applicable, invoicing and payment requirements should be included. Also prepare the cost sheet to include a bid scenario. For example, if the exchange is going to apply one lump sum cost, be sure to highlight that. If it is going to be a market basket with percentage discounts, put that instead. Either way, the vendor should have an idea of what you are looking for in terms of cost. You also want to include any attachments you may have, such as examples, samples, and drawings. And finally, depending upon the commodity or service that your agency needs, it is prudent to consider the national industry standards when writing your specifications. Here is an example of how some specifications may or may not get you bids for the desired item you're aiming for. Since each statement has the word must in front of it, each is a mandatory requirement that the vendor must be able to meet. If even one of them is not met, then the vendor would be disqualified. Imagine that you're employed at a local zoo and you're looking to exhibit a selection of animals at an upcoming fair. You're looking to show off one particular animal that the zoo currently does not own. Therefore, you submit a request for quotations or a purchase requisition with the following specifications hoping to purchase that particular animal. The specifications are as follows. It must be an animal, it must be multicolored, and it must have four legs, a tail, and two ears. Let's see what kind of bids we might receive. With those specifications, you might receive bids for a pony, zebra, and deer. Each of these meet the criteria in the mandatory specifications. They are each multicolored animals with four legs, a tail, and two ears. It makes sense that each of these animals could be displayed as part of a zoo exhibit. You might even receive bids for a tiger, leopard, and giraffe. If any of these animals are what you are looking for, then these were well-written specifications. They were clear and concise and garnered enough competition from vendors to meet your specific need. In closing, it's important to remember that the first step of the writing specifications process is to determine what your need is. From there, you'll be able to develop mandatory specifications accordingly. Again, be careful not to be too restrictive in your statements, but also don't be too vague. With practice, you'll learn to write quality specifications. Should you have any questions about the information covered in this presentation, contact your designated purchasing buyer or Staff Development Specialist Samantha Knapp at 304-558-7022. Print the Certificate of Completion and have it signed by your immediate supervisor or manager. Then email a copy of it to samantha.s.knapp at wv.gov or fax it to Samantha's attention at 304-558-6026. Thank you for taking the time to view this Writing Specifications online module.